Welcome back to Inside the Guard. I am TP Grant, and today we are talking about the Ultimate Fighter Season 20 finale and UFC on Fox 13. I will also sprinkle some World Series of Fighting in there, as it was an absolutely packed weekend of fights. Uh, before we really get into details, it was remarkable how strange the fights were at UFC on Fox on 13. Just something in the air in Phoenix that night. Uh, we had two fighters take themselves out of the fight through takedown. Uh, Jamie Varner attempting a lateral drop on Drew Dober knocked himself out and then was had to retire on that note. And then Joe Riggs uh, tweaked his own neck, taking Ben Saunders to the ground. As someone who has injured his neck in takedown drilling, uh, or takedown sparring, I should say, uh, it's an absolutely terrifying experience. That was followed by John Moraga staring at Jason Herzog after he had been low-kicked uh, in the cup. Uh, Herzog told them to keep fighting. Moraga didn't turn back to face Willie Gates, and Willie Gates socked him in the side of the head. We had Claudia Gadelia throwing a punch after the bell. It was just a really odd night of fights. Uh, but there were some, there were some definitely things worth talking about in that. And we're going to start today's show looking at the main event of the UFC on Fox, talking about Junior Dos Santos and Stipe Miocic. It was an extremely close fight that I did not view live because I was at a holiday party, which caused me to miss the last four fights of the card live. I watched it the morning after on Sunday, and I, I heard from a lot of people that there was quite a few people scoring the fight for Miocic and kind of the Twitter verse and uh, amongst MMA fans. And watching the fight, uh, when I watched it, I was unaware of that movement. I, I very clearly saw the fight ending up being for Junior Dos Santos, agreeing with the judges in that I thought Junior Dos Santos solidly won the last three rounds. Um, I thought Stipe came out strong. Uh, he really took advantage of some things going on with Dos Santos, which we're about to talk about. And then Dos Santos kind of settled back in and really took control of the later rounds and really took over that fight uh, and and proved to be very, very effective later in the fight. And it was a, an amazing showing from both fighters. I know there were some people complaining about the quality of this fight, but you don't often get heavyweights who are throwing with that amount of volume for that amount of time. So, yes, both tight fighters definitely got tired in this match. Uh, and Junior Dos Santos looked significantly slower uh, at times in this fight than he has in the past. But overall, I thought it was a pretty outstanding fight between two very, very good uh, heavyweights. And coming out of it, it sounds like people, I think rightfully so, are very impressed with Stipe Miocic. And a lot of people are cooling on Junior Dos Santos in terms of him being an elite-level heavyweight. Or kind of that, like, in that tier with Cain Velasquez where it's, Kane and Dos Santos and then everyone else in the heavyweight division. And it does feel that that Dos Santos has come a bit back down to earth. It's also possible that people have just kind of, or that at least Kane has laid out the blueprint on how to beat Junior Dos Santos. But one of the things that I saw going on here, uh, personally watching this fight, is I believe we saw Junior Dos Santos attempting to tinker with his game. It was talked about in the broadcast that Junior Dos Santos has recently moved his camp to uh, Nova Uniao, which uh, in Rio de Janeiro, which obviously is a, a top level MMA camp, but not usually associated with the heavier weight classes, particularly heavyweight. They're usually associated with those lighter weight classes. And at in some ways, or in a lot of ways, Junior Dos Santos looked pretty much unchanged. He still is primarily a boxer. He still fights in the middle of the cage. He doesn't throw any kicks. His clinch striking is still very basic, and he doesn't operate that well against the fence. But I feel like there were some subtle, subtle changes in his game, and that's going to lead us to uh, our first, uh, or my first, like, segment that we're going to be introducing here on on uh, in inside the guard, a, a hopefully a recurring segment. Anytime we kind of talk about a a particular fighter, not necessarily reinventing themselves, but adding something to their game. We're going to call this new segment something fun and snappy. I'm going with the MMA level up. 
And yes, I threw in the sound effect from Skyrim, because it's fun. And yes, I know, MMA and martial arts doesn't in fact work like that, but if you find yourself upset by this fact, just tell yourself, it's just a show, and I should really just relax. So, looking at Junior Dos Santos in this fight, this fight really seemed like a guy who was starting to tinker with new aspects of his game, and for the first two rounds, it was not going well. Junior Dos Santos was not moving backwards well at all against Miocic early on. Uh, he seemed very intent on staying off the cage at all costs, uh, and while he did end up there, he would circle off rather suddenly, and he had a bad tendency of kind of not quite running, but looking to break distance rather suddenly and and not keeping his hands up, which I know is not the pinnacle of striking defense, but his head would be straight up in the air, his arms would be down at his side, and be getting uh, clipped by Stipe as he was moving away. Uh, and later in the fight, you saw uh, Dos Santos really starting to punch as he was moving and circle off the cage more effectively. And against the cage is where Velasquez just brutalized and it was clearly within Stipe's game plan to take advantage of that hole in Dos Santos' game and really get Dos Santos against the cage and go to work on him. And Dos Santos showed a pretty good ability to keep things at, at distance. The uh, amount of work that that Stipe was amount, uh, able to do in the clinch wasn't that high. In fact, uh, Fight Metric only had about 20% of the significant strikes landed by Miocic in the entire fight landed in the clinch. Um, and while Dos Santos was only able to land 5% of his strikes in there, I mean, it, it was clear that, that Stipe had the advantage in the clinch, but they did not spend a significant amount of time in the clinch against the cage. Dos Santos was much, much more effective at breaking away from the clinch and escaping the clinch than he was in previous fights. Another aspect we saw... Um, Dos Santos using was he was he was throwing more body shots um, and this was something that I noticed early on he's always been a body worker like Dos Santos has always had body shots in his game of about 10% of his overall offense being devoted to the body normally according to fight metric he's in the 20% of his strikes landed going to the body and in this fight it was at 36% of his strikes going to the body and I think that was really evident later in the fight as Miocic was the one who drastically slowed down in the fourth and fifth rounds and really allowed Dos Santos to take off. And in the fourth round, um, on the fifth round, I should say, Dos Santos landed 20 body shots, uh, the highest of any round uh, in the fight, uh, the second most hit being the 10 that he landed in the third round. And again, uh, eight landed in the fourth round all of which significantly more than he landed in the first two rounds combined. So Dos Santos's commitment to the body shot, I think, was an impact in this fight. Uh, obviously, his footwork staying off the cage, he's working much, much harder to keep things in the center of the cage where he's at his best. And we did see some improvement of his clinch game. Uh, he hit that outside leg reap, that Asotogari style takedown. And if I misidentify the takedown for the judo people out there, please correct me. I'm not the best with the judo terminology, but to my eyes, that was an outside leg reap takedown. And uh, and Miocic landed very hard. I can I can attest from personal experience those outside leg reap trips. Uh, if you're not ready for them, it is a hard landing, and you will see guys in in judo tournaments get knocked out from that throw. And you could see Miocic, uh, I think he, he had to take a moment there when he landed to just get his breath back because I think that knocked the wind out of him. So uh, Dos Santos not completely reinventing his game, but it seems like he has some subtle changes that I think are going to serve him well as he ages. But he's still taking a lot of damage. He's still getting hit a lot. Uh, I think the fact that he relied on aggression and intimidation and athleticism for his striking defense is becoming more apparent as he is getting hit a lot more. Uh, so that is going to be a thing that I'm going to see. I would be interested to see if he continues to improve. If we start seeing defensive improvements, it's the last thing to come with strikers. Uh, Zane Simon, or I'm sorry, Patrick Wyman uh, may, has made this point many times that if you go back and look at really great strikers, uh, even Anderson Silva, defensive wizard, and you go back and watch him in Pride, he is very, very hittable in that time period of his career. 
And it really wasn't until he got to the UFC and Chris Lieben that we saw like a, a masterful defensive performance from Anderson Silva. So defense is the last thing that really gets developed. I'm going to be interested to see if that is something that Dos Santos comes up with or if he continues to be a guy that relies on on his chin and his toughness to get him through fights rather than uh, sound technical work. And if the first is the case, if he, I think we're going to start seeing Junior Dos Santos getting knocked out at some point because all, chins crack if you put enough pressure on him. So hopefully he can continue to evolve his game. But we saw some subtle changes in this fight that, that indicate that Dos Santos is thinking about his overall approach to MMA. Based on what I saw on Sunday morning, I think there is a strong argument to be made that the physical decline of Junior Dos Santos is underway. He's lost a step. He looks significantly slower. He had to he had less explosive movements in this fight than in previous fights. But I don't think there's enough evidence to make the case that the decline of Junior Dos Santos as a fighter is fully underway yet. He's still one of the most powerful strikers in the division. He's still an excellent offensive striker and boxer. And if he's tweaking up his game, I think this may be more of a this may have been more of a coming out party for Stipe Miocic as an upper-level heavyweight than us waving goodbye to Junior Dos Santos as a top-five heavyweight. So, a bit of a dubious first MMA level up in Junior Dos Santos, but I think we can see clear moves being made to improve his game. So, that was the MMA level up. We're going to move into a little bit more of a, a meta-game discussion of MMA through the lens of Rafael Dos Anjos versus Nate Diaz. Uh, or really kind of the how people prepare for fights, because this fight, uh, a, an absolute drubbing of Diaz by Dos Anjos, uh, it really, really highlights nicely the, kind of the old school way of preparing for fights versus the new school way of prepping for fights. Nate Diaz being kind of a, a just scrap kind of guy in the, in the vein of like a, a BJ Penn, uh, the Diaz brothers have a defined style. They come in, they are looking to volume box, they're looking to pressure you against the cage, unload with their hands, and trap you very similar to how boxers trap fighters in corners. The Diaz brothers hope to trap fighters up against the fence. And they have their outstanding jujitsu to fall back on if they get taken down. And really their guards act as a form of wrestling because they're or they're a takedown deterrent because if you take them down you know you have to deal with their guard game so very rarely will you see fighters shoot for takedowns on them and if they do it's almost always later in fights because when everyone's fresh and dry you really don't want to be in a Diaz brothers guard Rafael Dos Anjos on the other hand comes from a very new school for a form of thought he very much tailors himself to his opponent he makes the most of his time in preparation he has a set skill set i mean he's an obviously an outstanding kicker um he has great jujitsu the the other aspects of his game i mean there are other aspects of his game that is more, more defined but he will tailor his particular fight plans to his opponents and he sticks to them with a, an amazing amount of dedication and fights incredibly smart and as a result has been on this incredible run through the lightweight division and now at this point is getting a shot at Anthony Pettis uh, if all the signs I'm hearing are correct he's the next guy in line to fight Anthony Pettis and he executed what can only be termed as the perfect anti-Diaz plan it would work equally well for Nate or for uh, Nick and now some of the aspects of it are not surprising and we've seen them in, in use before Obviously, number one thing when you're fighting a Diaz brother is you cannot be on the cage. Uh, the Carlos Condit Nate Nick Diaz fight typified this. A lot of people criticized Condit for running, but anytime he felt his back getting close to the cage, he would cut an angle and then he would immediately open the distance between the two of them. And in some cases, that did involve a light jog. And he would go back to the center of the cage where he could have a better command of the distance using his kicks. The kicks being another clear aspect of fighting Diaz brothers. Josh Thompson using them to amazing effect against Nate Diaz, knocking out Nate Diaz, uh, something that really most MMA fans haven't seen as a Diaz brother getting finished by strikes. 
Um, the the Diaz brothers have basically no kick defense. They're incredibly vulnerable to kicks. Their basic plan on kicks is to counter them with punches and try to end the fight before the damage from kicks really start piling up or to cause people to uh, abandon the kicking game because they're eating so many punches to throw them. Uh, and really, those those aspects aren't aren't a great secret. I think a lot of MMA fans know that that's how you beat the Diaz brothers. Dos Anjos just executed it perfectly. One of the key things is that he did not allow himself to get backed up. He stayed in the pocket. He was parrying very, very well. Uh, in many instances, you saw him using his arms, using his hands to deflect both punches and a couple of kicks that uh, Nate threw out there. Not incredibly effective kicks, but uh, kicks nonetheless. Uh, utilizing angles, moving backwards, making sure he was never going back in a straight line, especially against a fighter as rangy as Nate Diaz. Going straight backwards is not a a strategy that's going to work for you long term because he's going to be able to reach you, especially once you hit that cage. Staying off the cage, obviously a huge aspect of uh, fighting Diaz brothers, as mentioned. And then Dos Anjos countered about every time Nate tried to push forward behind his strikes, uh, Dos Anjos not only evaded the strikes, but answered back with a diverse array of offense. And usually it's centered around that nasty outside leg kick, which he used to just absolutely punish the lead leg of Diaz. Diaz started switching stances, trying to take the pressure off of his front leg. And really that killed a lot of Nate's forward motion. And once Nate's forward motion was gone, that was it. He was really kind of out of the fight. He was very, very ineffective. The Diaz brothers do not fight well going backwards. And then towards the end of the fight, once uh, Dos Anjos had Diaz tired, had a little bit, the, the Diaz brothers do not tire as us mere mortals do. They they have cardio for days, obviously. But getting getting beat up as badly as Nate was in there, uh, is going to impact anybody. Uh, Dos Anjos started taking it to the ground, and we saw a very, very excellent um, uh, strategy on neutralizing a dangerous closed guard. Namely, don't be in the closed guard. Uh, Dos Anjos was standing immediately, and when he went to engage the guard, he was immediately looking for that knee slide pass, which forced Nate to play half guard much of the time. Uh, and this is a very common strategy in sport grappling when you want to avoid really no one the, the no one goes into the closed guard in sport grappling at the highest levels by choice because it's just such a difficult position to work from and cl- avoiding the closed guard is very much a key part of a lot of guard pl- passers games because the closed guard can slow you down so badly and it can be dangerous so we saw Dos Anjos standing we saw him working that and basically forcing the action to half guard and from there, that Nate really doesn't have that much of a game in the sense of against a high-level opponent like Dos Anjos. And Dos Anjos, obviously, a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, working with a, a, a high-level competitor, Felipe de la Monica, from Gracie Baja, a gentleman that I've actually uh, trained with and rolled with myself on a few occasions at seminars, and he'll come out and visit our school um, uh, incredibly nice gentleman, very, very thoughtful about jiu-jitsu and grappling, um, and and really has helped Dos Anjos build a really functional grappling game for MMA, and we just saw just an outstanding showing from Dos Anjos, and really the cherry on top of it was him g- going right back Nate Diaz. When Nate Diaz started doing the open hand slaps from inside the guard, Dos Anjos just immediately responding, standing up and delivering <laughs> delivering some pretty authoritative uh, slaps of his own. So I, it really felt like Dos Anjos beat Nate in every aspect of MMA and in every aspect of Nate's old game. He beat him in the uh, the striking department. He beat him in jiu-jitsu. And then he beat him in the so- showmanship uh, also, so it was an excellent showing from Dos Anjos. He absolutely deserves to be the next number one contender. While we wait for Khabib Nurmagomedov to recover from his knee injury, and uh, I really look forward to seeing what sort of game plan he brings against uh, Anthony Pettis. We are now going to jump over to the Ultimate Fighter season twenty finale with Carla Esparza versus Rose Namajunas, and. I think a lot this this fight needs to be talked about for a couple of reasons because number one, uh, obviously uh, Esparza took it to Rose in the last two round uh, in this in the second and third round ended up finishing a rear naked choke, 
Uh, and it ended up being very surprising for a lot of people watching. Uh, Rose was considered the favorite coming into this match. And that speaks to uh, just a tendency with people to overvalue fights on the actual season of The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, it's it's It goes very much with what we were just talking about in the sense of the Nate Diaz versus Rafael Dos Anjos and the way you prepare in that the Ultimate Fighter basically forces fighters to compete in a, or to prepare for a fight in a similar manner that fighters did in the early 2000s, where you really didn't tailor a game plan to every, anyone. You just kind of had your style, and you just went out there with your personal style and mashup of skills, and you pitted it against other people, and you kind of saw what the results were. The, the Ultimate Fighter House, you're, you're cutting weight, you're trying to make weight multiple times in an extremely short amount of time. You're stacking fights on top of each other. You're living and training with the people you're going to fight. There's an immense amount of uh, psychological pressure on fighters. Uh, Uriah Hall kind of being a classic example of how a fighter can exploit that, where Uriah Hall in, in his season just so thoroughly intimidated everybody based on what he could do in the gym that a lot of those matches were won before he stepped in there. And I think Rose Namajunas has a style ideally suited for the Ultimate Fighter because she thrives in those weird, chaotic positions. And she kind of she has that wild style that's very hard to predict and has its holes, but you really have to kind of study her and, and prepare yourself to really exploit that where on the Ultimate Fighter, you're kind of getting thrown in there and everybody's more or less off their game. And I think a, a commenter said it, or I, I can't remember if someone on Buddy Elbow comment line or on Twitter commented that pretty much on Tough, you get everyone's B plus, like B minus or C plus game because of all the factors going into it. And I think Rose is just ideally suited to kind of thrive in that particular environment. And then you get off the show and suddenly you have a full camp, you have a set opponent that you know you're fighting months ahead of time, and you're able to game plan for them. And in that case, Carla Esparza just had every advantage coming into this. She's far more experienced. Um, I I had some people arguing with me on Twitter that the fact that Rose took uh, amateur fights four years ago and that Carla Esparza was starting her professional career four years ago means that they've both been fighting for four years. And while that is literally true... There's a huge difference between amateur competition and professional competition. There's a huge difference in the level of training that Rose has been doing in the two years she fought amateur and then the one year, or her first year of professional uh, competition and this last year in terms of the quality of training she's been having. Um, and the fact that Carla Esparza was wrestling at a pretty high level for, for women's wrestling uh, up until then. Um, it... Asparza also being uh, the champion of the weight class in Invicta, being in there against other elite female fighters uh, beforehand, it, it's one of those things. Asparza is just further down the road in every aspect than Rose. And you really could see this was a classic, classic, uh, this was a uh, fight that you look for in a prospect's developmental career, especially prospects who like to grapple aggressively the way Rose does, is... Uh, Equally aggressive grapplers who are more experienced and in some cases or in many cases larger will at some point tap them out or just hand them their ass on the ground. Uh, And it's something you see very frequently with prospects. Either they're winning the fight and then things go south very, very suddenly and they get submitted. Think uh, the Charles Oliveira-Jim Miller fight how Oliveira was high-flying and everything seemed to be doing all right, and then he went for a leg lock and he ended up in uh, in getting knee-barred by Jim Miller. That's a, that's a pretty textbook example of things suddenly going south in a grappling exchange on a prospect. Or this, this fight between Rose and Carla where the more aggressive, larger grappler just is able to exert their dominance over a over a prospect who is wild and skilled but hasn't quite learned what it's like to get beat like that. And I think in this case, it's going to be a positive for Rose. She's super young. She's only been fighting professionally for two years. She's two and two. She's only had four professional fights at this point in her career. 
So she has a lot of room to grow. So the biggest mistake you could make after, if, if you were one of the people who went very high on Rose after the Ultimate Fighter, the worst thing you could do is now completely jump ship and say that Rose is trash. She has things to work on. She has development to do. But she has a lot of physical tools in place to be a successful MMA fighter. And if she fills them in, she could come back to that championship level at some point. Um, and even if she doesn't, she's likely to be a, a top 10, top 15 UFC strawweight for quite a while. Um, just based, again, on the fact that there aren't that many strawweights in the women's UFC divisions. And she is a fairly good fighter. She, Even though she did have we talked about how much you can take away from a tough fight she was submitting other good athletes and other good fighters so that can't be overlooked completely so um i would say i would very much preach like a a moderate view on rose right now don't expect too much but also don't completely write her off i think she's going to be back give her another two years to develop and i think we'll be able to speak much much more firmly on where we feel uh, Rose's career is headed than we are in this moment where she's just lost the Ultimate Fighter finale. All right, we're going to close down the show today with an in-depth look at some of the leg locks that were going on this weekend between Husamara Pagliaris and Ian Antwistle. We had some pretty nasty leg twisting going on, and we're going to take a deep, uh, deeper look at it and break it down a little bit. So, We're going to first look at Ian Entwistle because he really had kind of the beginning of the leg lock we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about why John Fitch ended up screaming in pain and getting his leg turned inside out uh, because of the way he chose to escape. So uh, we've got some pictures coming up for you people with the video. If you're listening on audio, I'm going to describe it the best I can. But I recommend that you look up the video at some point when you have the opportunity. So, Ian Intwistle uh, is a heel hook guy. Uh, that's his favorite submission. And against Anthony Burchak, he, he looked for it very, very early on. And right now I've got a shot up where you can see that he's going for an entry. Ian Whistle is going for the entry. He's going for the setup of his heel hook while Burchak is attempting to stand and, and strike him. And what I want you to look at is it, one of the key things in terms of leg attacks is where the leg locker is putting his feet and his legs because controlling your opponent is very, very important in leg locks. Uh, it's very easy to lose your your uh, your victim, uh, especially in Nogi where they're able to sometimes, a lot of MMA fighters will just turn and attempt to limp leg out of leg locks in the same way they try to limp leg out of single leg attempts. So what's going on here is Entwistle's left leg, the leg that is not on, not attempting to come over the leg of Burchak, is hooking Burchak's free leg. And we're going to get into why he's doing that in a little bit, but that's a very, very key detail. Meanwhile, Entwistle's left leg is coming across in what jujitsu guys would term as a knee reap. And this is illegal in some jujitsu competitions because uh, they say it puts pressure on the knee. Uh, it also forces uh, Burchak's leg to bend, which you can see uh, the leg is being bent. And actually, Burchak in this case is actually throwing a strike with his right hand, which is actually taking his momentum the, the direction he doesn't want to go. Right now, Burchak wants to be trying to turn his shoulders square to face and whistle and get his right foot square on the ground. Um, if your foot is on the ground, flat on the ground, the foot that's being attacked, you cannot be ankle locked, you cannot be heel hooked. Uh, it, it is a fairly safe position. But as long as your knee is bent and your foot is off the ground, you are in danger. And the way Burchak attempted to strike at Entwistle while he was in this position actually compromised him uh, a bit more than it would have if he had restrained himself and not thrown strikes and attempted to just defend the footlock. Burchak eventually realized that he was in a really bad spot and attempted to turn and limp leg out. Uh, And you can see here that it it ended up just helping uh, Entwistle because now the heel's fully exposed and he's starting to twist on it. And because that far leg 
had hooked Burchak's leg, it made it very difficult for him to turn. Entwistle was able to control his opponent, and it stopped him from being able to turn completely around and slide his foot out. And they ended up falling to the ground. And once they were on the ground, uh, the Burchak went for the rolling escape, where you attempt to roll out of your the the heel hook and we're going to talk about well let's talk about right now we're going to take a look at a a a quick little snippet of a riley bodycomb video that he put out uh in an attempt as part of his no kirka um dvd set he put this video up on youtube i'm going to put the actual video the full video explaining the defense in the article with this so you can see it also go check out the video on youtube if you don't have access to the article and if you like no gi grappling and leg locks at all buy no kirka because raleigh body combs put together one of the better instructionals on leg locks that i've seen the second volume on leg locks outstanding and he talks about the need if you're going to escape a a heel hook you need to be able to turn with the twist on your knee um, and you want to be able to turn independently of your opponent. If you're both spinning together and staying in the same position uh, in, ter- in reference to each other, you're not actually getting anywhere. And you can see in this picture, or you can see in the video, that uh, he's talking about the need to get rid of that foot that's hooking your leg. You need to be able to eliminate that leg so you can spin freely and, and spin without them following. And now you can see in this picture that Burchak was not able to do that. He was not able to get that leg out of there. And Entwistle had that leg hooked, and they were able to roll together. And one of the things body cone warms against is you don't want to be rolling to cover ground. You don't want to be rolling across the mat. You want to spin in place and drop your hip to the ground. Um, and that's what, that is what uh, John Fitch attempted to do to Husamal Pagliaras, is he attempted to spin out... And, and the problem with Fitch was he didn't actually really commit that hard to the move. He attempted to just turn belly down and push out. He didn't do the full turnaround that Raleigh Bodycomb showed where you actually like do a full 360-degree spin and circle your leg out of danger. Um, and as a result, Fitch only did partial spin and ended up in that, in that absolutely nasty knee bar. And once Pardiaris has it, that knee bar, it's the same. It's the same chain that he used on David Avalon in the 2011 ADCCs, where uh, Alvion ended up screaming and tapping in a very similar fashion to that of John Fitch. Um, so, a, a, an incorrectly applied escape there, um, and John Fitch talking about how he didn't actually bring in any leg lock specialists to work with in the lead up to that fight probably want to reassess. Probably not the best decision in retrospect. Um, and Burchak makes the mistake of he, he goes for the role that covers distance but doesn't actually get him anywhere. And Entwistle is able to stay with him. And then in the finish, the way uh, Entwistle stops the role is, number one, the the cage stops the distance covering role. And then you can see in this shot right here that Entwistle's leg, the reaping leg, has come all the way through and is locked up here. And this, this position right here... Um, Burchak is not able to spin either to cover distance or to rotate independently of Entwistle. And at this point, he's absolutely locked up, and it's over. The The submission actually ended up coming, and um, Burchak appeared to be grabbing his ankle afterwards. So the heel hook does primarily attack the knee, but the, the foot seemed to be a little bit low for the traditional heel hook, like what you look for. Um, and the twist I, apparently ended up hurting his ankle, which is a possibility in these cases. So sometimes the heel hook gets the, gets the knee, and in other cases it will twist the ankle. So the uh, Paul Yaris one is a classic. If the guy goes to spin and you can stop the spin partway through, you can get them to spin directly into a heel, uh, directly into a knee bar, I should say, which Paul Harris is, is absolutely a master of chain leg lock attacks, uh, one of the best out there. So uh, an outstanding display of leg locking from two guys, um, and in both cases uh, a pretty good example of the idea that a lot of MMA fighters don't rely a little too heavily on their ability to just disengage out of leg locks and don't have that technical of a defense for leg locks. And when you stalemate their ability to just simply disengage and slip out, they don't have much of an answer other than spinning and toughness. 
and spinning isn't always the answer in leg locks and toughness definitely isn't the answer when it comes to leg locks. So uh, that, that was, it was, it ended up being pretty nasty. Happily the heel hook didn't end with a destroyed knee, but John Fitch, uh, he, he may be having a little bit of knee trouble for the, the prospective future. So that was inside the guard UFC Fox 13 and ultimate fighter finale. Uh, on a little World Series of Fighting sprinkled in there also. Uh, we will be back. Hopefully, uh, we will. Uh, the holiday season should not disrupt the show too much. I'm hoping to be coming at you uh, on a fairly regular basis following any card that had television uh, associated with it. Fight Pass cards, it's not happened. Sorry about that. But, uh, you know, got to draw the line somewhere. So, hope you all had a fantastic time. We'll catch you next time.